Hello and good evening, everyone, and welcome to this new edition of the Heidelberger Salon, the digital format of the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Laws Berlin office. We are streaming and broadcasting live tonight from our Berlin office at, at Gendarme Markt in the center of Berlin. And I'm very pleased that we have with us a group of four colleagues from the Institute who are dedicating their work mainly on the role of law in our age of environmental crisis. And I'm also very pleased that we have with us tonight two members of our academic advisory board, Dean Jutta Brunet, who is also the chair of the academic advisory board and Justice Andreas Paulus of the Federal Constitutional Court and also professor of international law at the University of Göttingen. Tonight is a kind of reenactment of a discussion we had during the meeting of the academic advisory board back in November. The board uh, is evaluating our institute every three years and reports to the president of the Max Planck Society. That's an exercise that we undergo as any other of the 86 uh, institutes of the Max Planck Society. And um, we, are also, we are very grateful to the academic advisory board and also our board of trustees for doing that work of evaluation and also engaging in a discussion about our work with us at the Institute and also here tonight. And uh, tonight, I'm very pleased, as I said, that we will have also Dean Brunet of the University of Toronto Law School, who is currently the chair of our academic advisory board, but of course, also one of the leading authorities in the field of international environmental law. So in a way, she's doubly qualified, and we are very pleased to have her here with us tonight. And we have also, or I hope we will have shortly with us, uh, Justice Andreas Paulus of the German Federal Constitutional Court, who is also a member of our academic advisory board and also a professor of international law at the University of Göttingen. I hope we will see him among us very shortly. I will introduce the four panelists uh, shortly, just some housekeeping um, housekeeping informations. We will record this meeting tonight and hope to be able to put it up on YouTube afterwards. We are very pleased that we have so many participants from all parts of the world. Many more have indicated their interest and therefore we would like to make this resource also available um, afterwards. We would kindly ask you to um, put off your camera and also your microphone during the presentations. You will then have a chance to participate in the subsequent discussion. For the discussion, as usual uh, in our meetings, we would kindly ask you to indicate in the chat that you um, would like to pose a question, and then we will uh, invite you to put on your camera and to ask this question or pose this question in person. But without further ado, I now would like to, um, to proceed to our panel presentations. I'm very pleased to have four colleagues uh, who are senior research fellows at the Institute and who are working from different an angles uh, on issues that are related to the environmental crisis in its different facets and uh, who are also very actively and reflexively um, think about the role of law and the role of lawyers in this crisis in its different nuances. And it's my pleasure to, to welcome tonight and to introduce you to, to you tonight, uh, Guillaume Futazar, Tom Sparks, Dana Schmalz and Pedro Villarreal, Saskia Stucki, who also is announced on the program, is unfortunately not able to be with us tonight. We are very sorry and wish her good health uh, and a, a quick recover recovery. I can reassure you that it's also uh, really worthwhile to um, to uh, get some information about Saskia's work. Of course, as it is true for any other participant tonight, you will find uh, information on her work on our website. And um, I can only encourage you to look into this more further. But first of all, I would like to give the floor to my dear colleague, Dr. Guillaume Futazar, senior fellow at the Institute, who will talk to us about his work and the overarching questions that relate his topic to environmental crises in, in their different uh, nuances and appearances. Guillaume, you have the floor. 
Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. So, um, my name is Guillaume Futazar, PhD uh, researcher at the Institute for International Public Law. So, my main focus at the MPI is to study the evolution of international environmental law. And specifically, um, I focus on international biodiversity law. And through this, which is already a big field, I'm particularly interested in the ways that the architects of the system are trying to deal with complexity. So what do I mean by complexity? I think complexity is basically the characteristic of a system with different components that are interacting in a certain way, which makes it difficult to predict how the system will react to a change. So when you have a system that is characterized by complexity, it's difficult to see possible outcomes. And Complexity in international environmental law can be seen at, under three different lenses. So first of all, you have the notion of legal complexity, where you have such an accumulation of different norms in different fields that it's kind of difficult to figure out how they will articulate between each other. Then you have, of course, institutional complexity because of the sheer amount of people participating in creating this system and sustaining it. Sustaining it. So it's difficult to see how exactly they interact in terms of complementarity or conflict. And finally, another important element of complexity when thinking about intentional environmental law is physical complexity. The fact that the more we know about the environment, the harder it becomes to craft exactly and precise norms that are fit for the purpose. Okay, so what does this mean for tonight's debate? What, what, how can we insert that into a broader discussion about the role of law in environmental crisis? What I think I try to highlight with my research is that you have to think of the problem in two different ways. The first one is that we might have a problem in terms of not having enough political will to come up with um, appropriate norms to tackle the environmental crisis. I think this is something that falls into the category of critical environmental studies and so on. With my reading of complexity, I'm also interested in how to better craft rules and norms um, that takes into account the characteristic of the environment. So this is, has something to do with physical complexity. Because we've seen in, over the recent year that we, had, we have a better knowledge of the intricacies of our physical environment. And the more knowledge we have, the more we realize that the older systems we have um, put in place decades ago are no longer fit for purpose. And that's something I'm trying to study throughout my... Um, my research. So I think to better understand this role of law in the environmental crisis, it's interesting to do a, a quick summary of the history of environmental law and international environmental law. When you look at environmental law, you see that the first approaches, mostly at the national level, were very fragmented, very um, unrefined, so to say. The first um, laws you would find uh, are laws that are dedicated to protecting certain species because they are deemed to be charismatic or basically useful. And in the 70s, which, is general, which are generally seen as the birth decade of international environmental law, you see some first attempts, at, at least at the global scale, to kind of engage with the physical complexity of the environment. And so, for instance, you see the, the push for the precautionary principle, which kind of acknowledged that you have to shred in a context of uncertainty. So there's already a bit of acknowledgement of this notion of complexity. And then you see some back and forth between the national level and the international level. For instance, in several different countries, we see um, that the legal systems are being irrigated by notion of ecology. So you see um, um, ideas such as ecosystem services, ecosystem approach, connectivity being something that becomes more and more normal into the national system. And this then percolates at the international level where you have um, new principles being recognized. For instance, um, the simple idea, but very hard to put in place, that you have to consider ecosystems in their entirety. So let's take a step back. What does that mean for the role of law in the environmental crisis? It means that a law a system, a legal system which is fit for purpose in our context has to be a system that is able to tackle the growing complexity um, that we are aware of in the environment. And what we have seen now is that this complexity is 
tackled, yes, but in a um, kind of a manage, uh, management way with, with approaches based on objective, indicators, management plan with plan, do, check, act sequences. So we don't really see laws that are trying to tackle full on the crisis. You are seeing laws that are trying to manage the crisis, which is somewhat um, a strange way of dealing with um, something that has been unanimously recognized as basically life-threatening. So let's take a very concrete example. Let's take that down to some um, very practical um, consideration. In the recent decades, we have been growing aware of the importance of animal culture in conservation. What is animal culture? So basically, we understood that for certain species, such as elephants or certain whales, some individuals among the species have knowledge about, for instance, migratory paths. This means that you cannot simply apply to the conservation systems of, for these populations just a system where you say, okay, just kill um, this amount of individuals and it should be okay for the conservation of the species. Because if by mistake you happen to kill one of the individuals that had the knowledge about migratory routes, then you put into danger a whole community. So this is now only emerging as a, new, um, as a new consideration for environmental governance. And we are seeing in the context of the conventional migratory species, how they're trying to deal with this new element of complexity. And for the moment, they're not doing much about it because they realize that the, the norm they had had to be profoundly reshaped in order to have something that is al allowing to preserve species, but also taking into consideration elements such as culture. So the more I go into my research, the more I am interested in seeing how complexity is taken into consideration. And currently I'm working on a book project uh, where we are analyzed in different uh, jurisdictions how judges deal with cases related to biodiversity and how specifically they look at the intricacies of um, biodiversity under a new lens, not an old lens of a static environment, but the, a lens of a dynamic and evolving environment. So that is basically um, all on my side. Of course, there's more to say. But if there's one takeaway message for this question of the rule of law in the environmental crisis, I think it's also a question of how to reconceptualize laws in a, in a context of environmental crisis for them to be better fit for purpose. Of course, the first thing is to create the political will, but even though, even if you reach that, you have to think about how to better tailor the norms to the objective you set to yourself. Thank you very much, Guillaume, for this uh, presentation in a nutshell of your research. And then I would like to give the floor to Tom Sparks. Dr. Tom Sparks is also a senior research fellow at the Institute. And uh, as Guillaume, he's also one of the in initiators of the World Lawyers Pledge, a project that he might also uh, just briefly introduce in his presentation. Thank you, Alexandra. And yes, I, I will briefly mention the, the Lawyers Pledge towards the, to the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you. Yes, as Alexandra said, I'm also a senior research fellow at the Institute, where I also work on aspects of environmental law, although in my case, primarily climate law. Um, and Guillaume spoke about different forms of complexity in his presentation. And I'd like to, to add a different one in, in my remarks, which is jurisprudential complexity. I'd like to start by thanking you, Alexandra, for the way that you framed this discussion, because I think you framed the, the, the question perfectly in what you've described as the multifaceted role of law. In the overlapping environmental crises of the Anthropocene, we can clearly see that the law plays a highly ambivalent role. Law is something that is made by the powerful, by vested interests in society. It solidifies power relations and tends to exclude the voices of those who are socially disadvantaged. And as such, it can be a very major factor in enabling environmental destruction. Business as usual is the root of the climate crisis, but fundamentally business as usual is something that is lawful. And yet in societies under the rule of law, the law is also one of the most powerful tools available to us to hold powerful actors to account. When it works well, the law can be the best hope for environmental protection. 
And a faith in the positive power of the law is one of the factors motivating the absolute explosion in the numbers of climate change lawsuits that we've seen filed before domestic courts all around the world in recent years. I want to respond to that theme by briefly talking about a recent chapter that I wrote, which deals with this dichotomy from a theoretical point of view. And then, as Alexandra said, I'll come on to mention a, a highly practical application that Guillaume and I have also with Saskia been working on the World Lawyers Pledge on Climate Action. The focus of the chapter I want to talk a little about is the state of nature. And I think probably most of you will be familiar with that concept. But for anyone who isn't, it's, it's one of the most influential concepts in the history of legal and political theory. And it's been used by uh, very diverse thinkers as the basis for some of the most important works in that area, including in Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, the Tru Two Treatises on Government by John Locke, and also by Samuel Pufendorf, who was the first person to hold a chair in the discipline that we would now call international law. Fundamentally, the state of nature is a thought experiment. It imagines uh, a time in human society before there were any laws, before there were states or nations, before political structures of any kind. And some authors like Hobbes thought that this would be a kind of hell on earth, while others thought that the state of nature would, on the contrary, be a, a sort of paradise. And the concept has always intrigued me and for a whole suite of reasons, but on this occasion, the question I wanted to answer was this. The Western political tradition is to a large extent founded in the ideas of the state of nature, but what, do, what role in it does nature actually play? I started looking into this and, and in my chapter I contrast three different state of nature theories from, from Hobbes, Locke and also from the English philosopher David Hume, and I found that in all three cases nature plays very little role. Nature is a, a canvas on which humanity's concerns play themselves out. I describe it as, as being a little like a stage in a theatre. It's there, it's vital, it supports the action, but at the end of the day, it's the play that we've all actually come to see. What I found even more interesting was that in all three cases, political and legal authority is founded in the state of nature on the control over and the use of natural resources. In the case of John Locke, that's particularly striking. And I say that because in many ways, it's Locke's version of the state of nature theory that is most amenable to ideas of protecting the environment. Locke has a proviso that anyone can appropriate any resource, but no more of it than can actually be used. But at the same time, in Locke's theory, it's important to appropriate that resource because the use of the resource is the basis of your claim to own it. So you have to use it, and you not only have to use it, but you have to use it maximally because that's the basis for your sovereignty. And so in my chapter, I, I compare this Lockean logic to several environmental regimes, and I find some really striking parallels in, in what may be one of the most dysfunctional of environmental law regimes, that is the Convention on the Regulation of Whaling. Now, for those of you who don't know the backstory of the whaling saga, it's a regime that seems to be riven by an irreconcilable disagreement about what the very purpose of the regime is supposed to be. Is the idea to prevent whaling altogether, so as to protect whales and to protect the marine environment? Or is its purpose to limit catch numbers just enough so that whale stocks can recover and so that we can go on merrily slaughtering whales for years to come? This is the kind of impasse we come to when the law embeds conceptions of nature as a resource and where it is control over and exploitation of the resources, which is the basis for a claim of sovereignty. And when we try to reorient the law towards environmentally protective ends, as was attempted in the whaling regime, the structure of the law itself can become an obstacle. I'm very happy to talk about the, the whaling regime in more detail if anyone has questions on that. But it's that kind of transformation, that kind of reorientation of the law that we need to make, and not only in the, in the whaling regime. We need to reorient every area of the law to focus on the goals of environmental protection. And here I'm talking about contract law, I'm talking about tax law, I'm talking about domestic criminal law. And that's the, the goal of the, the World Lawyers Pledge on Climate Action. This was a text that was drafted by Guillaume and me together with Saskia, who sadly can't be here this evening. 
And really the pledge is, is an open letter from lawyers to lawyers with a simple, but we think significant request to think about your practice of the law and to think about the ways in which it intersects with climate change. The simple message is do what you can in the things that you do. In the text, we make a, a set of specific recommendations for scholars, for students, judges, solicitors, civil servants, and others about how they can engage with climate action in their fields and in their jurisdictions. And to all of you who are lawyers who are listening, who I imagine is, is most people, I really encourage you to, to go to our website and read the pledge and our other materials and to consider signing up yourself and to committing yourself to joining this journey. I'll, I'll put a link in the, in the chat. Every person who, who signs the pledge adds to the momentum behind it. And our hope is to motivate a, a whole scale conversation about the way in which the legal profession relates to climate change and to the environment more broadly. To see the ways in which the law enables climate harm by states and companies and to reverse that role to turn the law into a positive force. I'll, I'll close with that, but I'll, I'll just mention a, a quote that I came across a couple of days ago. I, I apologize because I now can't find who said it, so I um, lack attribution here. But the quote reads, sometimes a, a hypocrite is a person in the process of transformation. And I hope that the, the dichotomy that we see in the whaling regime and in the law more broadly between enabling harm and offering protection is a hypocrisy in the process of transformation, because in the, the overlapping environmental crisis of the Anthropocene, that's exactly what we need. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And before we continue the tour de table, I would like to welcome uh, Justice Paulus. We had some technical issues to get you on board, but we are very happy to have you with us tonight. And we also look forward to your comments later on. Uh, but now I would like to give the floor to my colleague, Dr. Dana Schmalz, who is a senior research fellow at the Institute, but also this semester a visiting professor at the University of Jena. Uh, Dana, we are very much looking forward to your presentation and you have the floor now. Thank you, Alexandra and everyone being here. It's really a pleasure to be on this panel and to continue and hopefully expand the conversation we had briefly in November already. So I'm going to talk about two issues from my research briefly now. Population growth and how this has been an issue for international law and migration. And both of them are a bit more indirectly related to this rule of law in the age of environmental crises, but I think indirectly, but importantly. So I think of this current situation as one where humanity has to organize cohabitation on this planet in distress. And we are also thinking about all the specific issues of how the planet is in distress. But what is clear is that this raises significant normative questions on a global scale. And those two issues I am considering here, population growth and migration, are in a way both aspects of these large scale normative questions. So we can say cohabitation on a planet of how many and cohabitation where. So what about the movement on this planet? Um, I'll start with population growth and I'll give you a bit of a picture of how I'm working on this and how I think it relates to the questions we are discussing on the panel here today. So um, I interestingly, legal scholars actually don't talk much about population numbers or maybe for a good reason, but my claim is that population growth and how it's been perceived um, in society has actually had a great impact on how international law was formed. So I think of the relationship between law and population growth as somewhat threefold. There is the first level, the most obvious that law is a tool for regulating and it's a tool for influencing population developments. Then there is a second layer where the population numbers and the perception of population growth shapes the law. So kind of the other direction. And there is a third layer where law has really been an important side for giving interpretations. Um, it's what I call narrative authority. I'll explain a little more. Um, giving interpretations to population growth. And they're also the normative meaning this has uh, in um, human interrelations in society. So these three levels are important and I'm not only looking at, or I'm not only interested 
in this law regulating population, but even more on in the other levels. Um, Population growth has been this major issue of modernity. So the actual numbers are significant. Um, population, world population has gone from 1.6 billion in 1900 to roughly 7.9 uh, 7 billion today. But it's also been this major issue that is connected to so many um, social topics. It's connected to the social question, poverty, labor. It's connected to sexual relations, gender equality, and it's connected to these geopolitical questions, really international relations um, of different parts of the world. These 200 years we're looking at when we talk about the demographic transition are also the 200 years in which industrialization took place, which led to what we call the Anthropocene. And it's the 200 years in which modern law, not just international law, but also international law, took shape. So all of this really falls in a combined formative phase. More specifically, I'm interested in the first decades of the United Nations, so kind of jumping into the 1950s, especially 1960s, 1970s, and how population became an aspect in this key topic development. So development really in these decades was uh, not just one political concern, or not just one concern of international law, but, but it was kind of a, a key distinction um, between what today we would more call states of the global south, states of the global north, and developing developed states. And around these interpretations of what development means, development as industrialization, but also population numbers being so important to the understanding of development, international law played a key role in framing issues and given an interpretation. So I'll just outline the ideas I have about this and I'm happy to talk more in the discussion about it later. But I think there was really an aspect where in framing development in a specific way and in putting birth rates and um, population growth at, it's at a center point, someone started a screen share, it's not me. Um, in doing this, there was a way of framing it not as a question of distribution and of really also drawing attention away from questions of trade policy, from questions of um, global redistribution. So this focus on um, population numbers as part of development really had an impact in how international law developed in those decades. And in addition, of course, today, going, getting back to the core of our topic, there is a certain irony that at the time development was so much understood as industrialization, while today and population numbers as part of uh, the problem in hindering development, while today we often, feel, we often see population numbers mentioned as part of the problems in the context of climate change. So in a way, in the part of the problems of what industrialized development has caused the overuse of resources, etc. So this is one first part. Now, um, I am also interested, I'll just mention briefly, in more theoretically the relationship of human rights and human numbers, of this uneasy relationship of a demographic view and a view perspective of rights. And this is important in also how after the 60s and 70s later, the issue of population growth became reframed as reproductive rights not necessarily, um, certainly an improvement, but not necessarily doing away with the important normative assumption behind, which then just lost a bit of the language. Um, this is also a bridge to migration as a second issue I want to put on the table here. So I think in this of migration, we also see that often the um, framing in rights um, leaves questions of numbers at the side, but they re-enter through the back door. Um, we see this in some judgments of the European Court of Human Rights in recent years, but um, more specifically migration and the rule of law in the age of environmental crisis. So there I think of the key question for law as how to account for the, the interrelatedness of the world that is very obvious in climate change, in this in environmental degradation, but not necessarily um, reflected in the law. So we have in migration law, the general assumption that there is discretion of states to regulate immigration, to regulate access to territory, 
And we have also those few ideas in refugee law and human rights law of where states have obligations beyond borders. So to me, one question that comes up when we see how much climate change impacts migration actually on the ground is how migration law can account for all the complex causalities. Here I'm linking to the complexity that Guillaume has been talking about um, for the complex causalities that are present but not necessarily so easily translated into the law. So I think migration law can learn a lot from what our environmental law has been doing in these past years, work with the principles that there are and really reflecting these uh, complex causes. And overall, I think that, well, climate justice will have to be a partly also migration justice and these two dual issues of population numbers in unequal, unequally in different parts of the world and migration will be core concerns in dealing with uh, global justice in the coming decades. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to hand it back to Alexandra and look forward to a conversation. Thank you so much, Dana, for these uh, for offering these glimpses onto your current work and the main questions of your research. And then I now would like to hand over to uh, my colleague, Dr. Pedro, Pedro Villarreal, uh, also a senior research fellow at the Institute. And Pedro, we are looking forward to your presentation. You have the floor. Yes, thank you so much, Alexandra, for uh, extending us the invitation and the possibility to discuss this uh, major topic once again in a broader forum. And so I will base my own uh, presentation on much of what has already been said by my preceding uh, colleagues and so uh, but I will focus uh, as I do in my research currently on the COVID-19 pandemic as you know being embedded in this uh, and what Dana Schmalz referred to as a larger normative question related to international law and you know it might raise the question of that you know, the title of today's panel is, you know, refers to environmental crisis in plural. And you might be wondering, well, what does the pandemic have to do with such environmental crisis? But ultimately it's, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic that we are all experiencing is indeed embedded in these larger normative questions. And I will focus today on the matter and the problem of how law is ultimately at least the law related to pandemic prevention is um, mired with anthropocentrism and silo thinking that we need to overcome uh, mainly by tackling complexity in a different manner you know as guillaume uh, extensively uh, mentioned because ultimately pandemics and i guess it goes without saying but i think it cannot be uh, repeated too often uh, pandemics are embed embedded and even in this context of uh, complexity because the interrelation between humans and non-human animals and the environment stands at the core of such pandemic risk this is what drives you know the, the likelihood or the probability that a pandemic caused by a communicable uh, disease will occur and broadly speaking uh, in my research i have also touched upon the one health approach which is a multi-dimensional approach developed by international institutions. So some institutional way to deal with complexity because it includes not only the World Health Organization and others, but also the United Nations Environmental Program, recognizing somehow that the existing, the pre-existing approaches towards pandemic prevention had so far not tackled to a sufficiently uh, satisfactory extent, uh, you know, the, the multi-dimensional uh, facet of this problem. And although the emergence of pandemics as such under current international law is does not result in responsibility uh, for uh, any uh, state, you know, the fact is, or at least evident, evidence points towards how multiple human activities are known to increase pandemic risk. There are probabilistic scientific studies that uh, point to how they do so, how, you know, what humans, what we humans do ultimately makes us more, more exposed to, to the emergence of a pandemic. But I believe in comparison to environmental law where such an understanding has you know, been gradually incorporated, even despite the reactionary voices that 
for instance, engage in climate change denialism, e even despite these reactionary voices in the environmental law field, there is a stronger awareness of how human activities really uh, result in these environmental crises. Yet in the field of pandemics, this awareness is uh, weaker, I would say. Because if we look at the, the, the World Health Organization's international health regulations, which is the main legal instrument focusing on the cross-border spread of disease or international spread of disease, as it, it also refers to it, it has a mostly reactive approach. It addresses pandemics only after humans have been infected with a new or re-emerging disease, which depending on how infectious or contagious a disease may, may be, might be too late for a proper reaction. But of course, if we want to tackle these threats in an earlier stage, we do need to engage in such complexity that, as understood by Guillaume Fugazard, and we do need to tackle all the other drivers that we have somehow separated in these silos that we, you know, at, at least in the case of pandemic uh, prevention, in the, in the regulation of uh, pandemics and in hard law, I mean, these have been separated in silos. And yes, the question is how can we overcome these silos where the human component is somehow receiving a different treatment. But as I mentioned, by the time we focus, by the time this reaches the human, uh, the human dimension, maybe it is too late. And you know, the awareness uh, of looking, of the need to look beyond the human dimension of diseases is key for fostering what is known as pandemic deep prevention, a term coined by uh, Jorge Viñuales, Suri Moon, uh, Ginebra Lemoli, and Gianluca Borci, because we need a normative approach to explore what role should international law play in all of this. You know, although law is a man-made uh, construction and of course it regulates human activities, it does not mean that we humans must always uh, be the ultimate reference point and particularly not in the case of pandemics. Um, because the international health regulations anthropocentrism increases the blind spots in global health security. Uh, little wonder that an international law instrument with the purpose to prevent and protect us from the international spread of disease and mostly fails to do so when events like the COVID-19 pandemic emerge. Maybe, and similarly to what Tom Sparks was uh, explaining, maybe we need to uh, look again at, uh, no, similar to what happened in the whaling regime as Tom Sparks uh, discussed, our understanding of what the purpose of health security means and how to achieve it might need to be revisited from at the core of what is what the purpose is supposed to mean. So far, in my view, and looking at current negotiations at the World Health Assembly on a new legal instrument on pandemics, it is not clear which lessons exactly will be learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and by whom. We uh, can be concerned that there is a lack of inclusion of many stakeholders that which would need to be in these negotiations if we really want to take complexity seriously, because and even among the, the, the ones that are the stakeholders that are participating, consensus is not fully clear on what exactly we need to do in order to better pre prepare ourselves for future pandemics. So as lawyers and refer to the multifaceted role of law mentioned by Tom Sparks, I believe tackling complexity entails engaging more closely first with other fields of knowledge to address these overarching topics. Multidisciplinary insights are inevitable and escapable in, in order to know what is actually possible and feasible to do. And lastly, you know, although the end of the COVID-19 pandemic as, as a whole uh, is unfortunately not yet clear and, and clearly in sight, uh, and in, although recent data points towards the milder form of the disease, full eradication of the virus is very unlikely to occur in the near future. The final verdict of what can and should be done is still due, but uh, and as Tom also hinted upon, if returning to business as usual reflected in our pre-COVID-19 life is the main goal of the international community's action, we have certainly learned nothing of this tragic experience. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Pedro, and at the end of this uh, 
round uh, um, on the panel presenting work from the Institute, uh, current work, ongoing work from the Institute. I should again mention that it is really a void that is left tonight because uh, sadly Saskia Stucki can't be with us. Her work is very much focusing on global animal law where she has done uh, very important work these last years. It's a field that is also um, pioneered by uh, Anna Peters, one of the directors of the Institute and also Saskia's current work on green streaming very much comes from a perspective of the ecocentric uh, turn. So I can only encourage you here in the audience to look closer into her work and uh, in particular also the work on global animal law and uh, animal rights that is done at the institutes at the Institute. But without further ado, I would like now to hand over to our distinguished commentators. And uh, I would like to invite, first of all, uh, Dean Jutta Brunet, to present her comments and to um, discuss the presentations and the work that we have seen presented now on the panel. Dean Brunet, you, you have the floor. Thank you, that's uh, wonderful. I'm really delighted to be here and uh, also having scrolled quickly through all the names on the screen, it's just wonderful to see so many of you here and also see a number of names uh, of colleagues and friends are recognized. So I very much look forward to the discussion and in the interest of getting to that discussion relatively quickly, I um, also want to be quite brief. So I think Guillaume set us off uh, really very nicely for I, I think a core issue to wrestle with in when we ask about the role of law in these contexts of environmental crisis, and that is we have to grapple with what the role of law can be in conditions of complexity. And I was delighted, if I digress for a second again, to see Edith Brown Weiss here, who's obviously written on this and in and, and her framing, it is um, what is the role of law in a kaleidoscopic world, a multifaceted um, world where challenges shapeshift and interrelate. And so I think that's just one thing I want to underscore in what Guillaume said, that complexity, um, if you take climate change as one of the prime examples, um, means all the things that he outlined, but it also really means that we have, even within the issue itself, um, multiple issues intersecting from social issues to ethical issues, justice issues, economic issues, and the legal issues, um, um, atmospheric issues, and everything is connected. And what makes the challenge so complex is that none of the developments or in none of these areas are the developments linear or necessarily predictable. And when something changes in any one of these, it has impacts for the, the, the overall problem. Um, and the further dimension, and a number of the uh, speakers alluded to that already, um, uh, there was reference, uh, for example, um, also I think by Guillaume to political will, is that there we have not just a political will issue at the international level, but also at the domestic level. And so whatever challenges we encounter internationally, we have microcosms and versions of that at the domestic level. And so that's where uh, if you assume that in order for law to play a role, there has to be a foundation of shared understandings, either on the issue and how we deal with the issue, what the normative parameters should be. So if that's a challenge, then you can see that it's difficult for law to find its feet. And then relatedly, um, there need to be shared understandings about what kind of role we want law to play. Regulatory, is there an appetite for enforcement, compliance, accountability? and so on and so on. And so at the international level, needless to say, all of that is very challenging, compounded by the fact that we are structurally in a system where we still need to work with states whose consent, you know, in most circumstances we need in some shape or form. And so that's why I would want to posit that really for something like climate change, and I think the Paris Agreement might illustrate that, we may be at a point where what international law can do is to guide, to set the direct direction, to moderate conversations, create settings for conversations to take place, um, and, and also possibly to anchor um, um, modes of accountability. And the Paris Agreement really does that, right? In some ways, you might say, 
It's a multilateral environmental agreement also for the era of sovereign retrenchment. Here's another dimension. It has nothing per se to do with environment, but it's part of the complexity that we're struggling with these national debates about how we govern, what is the role of the rule of law, um, tendencies toward autocracy, and so on. So here we now have an agreement that says it's not possible for everybody to agree internationally to do something in this one way, um, in part because the conversations are just as challenging domestically and the shared understandings are just as in short supply domestically as they are internationally. Hence this bottom up approach where the agreement sets goals 1.5 degrees and certain normative parameters for the conversation sets an accountability framework and then says everybody domestically you guys have your conversation and we then want to hear what you can contribute and we're going to try and tie that um, commitment into these international parameters and to provide guardrails, if you will, to ensure transparency of performance and so on and so on. So I think that's one big role. This is not necessarily the same for all international environmental problems, but for something as it's everything as climate change, I think um, it may well, that may well be the key thing. That doesn't mean that other tools of an international environmental law are no longer useful. So I use I used to be quite skeptical, for example, of judicial avenues. I think domestically they play a much bigger role than at the international level, but even internationally, we may be at a point where we want to use all the tools we have and try and see whether we can fit the environmental square peg into the round hole, right? And this is um, we've heard um, uh, some of the speakers refer to the fact that environmental law is not necessarily, or international law is not ne necessarily always good for the environment. It also is part of um, the, well, the undercutting of what would need to happen um, uh, for environmental protection. Tom Sparks, interestingly, um, I, I thought what was interesting, you referring to the state of nature, I know your, your focus was slightly different, but what struck me is when you think about the, the assumption here is that the state of nature is something really very competitive, nasty, brutish, and short uh, in Hobbes framing, although maybe that was more about human nature than nature per se. But the irony is that nature isn't actually like that, right? It's cyclical, it's resilient, it's, it's interconnected, and law constantly pushes against that with most of the concepts that we use in an international law, sovereignty, um, uh, consent requirements, all that. Um, and that comes back to the square peg in the round hole. So if you wanted to go to an international tribunal, you would somehow have to use the very few rules that actually exist. And in customary law, it, it, uh, the, the, the rules remain focused for better or for worse on interferences with territorial interests and to the extent that they are concerned with common concerns, they remain underspecified. Now, I want to stay true to my word. There's a whole lot more to be said, and I just want to put a plug in. I happen to be a co-chair of um, a commission in the Institut de Droit International that is wanting to engage with this, what can the harm prevention rule do for us when it comes to protecting the commons? So there's work happening that I'm deeply interested in, but I won't go on about it because I want to pass the baton to Andreas and then um, for all of us to engage in a conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Bonnet. I will also pass immediately the baton to um, Andreas Paulus. Uh, Justice Paulus, for those of you who are not so familiar with the details of German constitutional law, is a member of the German Federal Constitutional Court's uh, First Senate. And he was concerned uh, also and is one of the authors of the court's already legendary and historical climate decision of March uh, 2021. Um, but um, I think he will, uh, in his comments, also indicate um, his perspective on uh, issues that are related to climate change and ecological, ecological change more broadly. Uh, Justice Paulus, you have the floor. We are very happy to have you with us tonight. Thank you very much, Alexandra. And I begin with an apology uh, for technical reasons i'm connected by my cell phone even if i am at my car through home uh, so i hope it is working and that was also the reason why i'm uh, afraid i didn't listen to guillaume's presentation 
happily I hear, heard him already uh, a couple of months ago uh, in connection with the Max Planck Institute. Um, I'm very glad to be here and of course I'm speaking here in my strictly personal capacity and I was a professor at the University of Göttingen so that's uh, a part of my, my uh, um, uh, justification of being here uh, is to have it, this, this double head but speaking in a personal capacity. Well, we've heard very well that uh, the environment is something which encompasses everything. Um, development, uh, trade, health, uh, all it all is connected to the environment in one way or the other. Um, that makes it a very complex uh, issue. Uh, and uh, um, I would say this complexity uh, plays out in myriad ways, but as lawyers, we have to try to give it a structure uh, and to look at part of the elephant, if you like, uh, if you allow this cooperation between the environment and the elephant uh, to allow us to, to give structure to our own uh, responses. Um, and uh, when we deal with climate change, um, this is a huge challenge for the law. Uh, and um, the, the activists, which we heard also speaking in, with the voice of Tom uh, tonight, um, is uh, in a way um, very much attached to that goal uh, to solve in a way climate change. Or we heard, we heard even more ambition from Dana speaking about climate justice, not only tackling climate change, but doing it in an equitable and just way. Um, this is adding uh, to the challenge or it may express an ambition which goes very far. Uh, so we have on the one hand a normative aspect which, which uh, gets us forward, which drives us forward. And on the other hand, however, we have a structure of public international law uh, to which uh, Utah just alluded uh, to and also um, Pedro, I think, did that, um, that actually is um, uh, in a way biased towards um, states and bias towards consensus. But if the ambition and the challenges are so great uh, and uh, are so difficult to meet, that of course is a structure with, which is, uh, even in the global warming perspective, incredibly cold uh, to, to that idea. Um, because requiring consensus um, requires, in fact, the uh, consensus with not only dictatorships, but also with those who want to try to, to um, get their little um, uh, uh, um, present advantage uh, uh, and are not oriented towards those uh, ambitious goals. Uh, even individuals are not speaking about the environment as such and of animals and of, of, of uh, rivers, as we have heard recently uh, in uh, Latin America. Um, individuals are often still uh, mediated by their states. Uh, but that also opens up an avenue uh, for uh, action, legal action within states, uh, uh, to which I'm going to, to uh, uh, speak uh, now. Uh, because also internationally litigation is rare and we have heard a lot of cold water already before the decision by the European Court of Human Rights that it may not actually happen, but it may be uh, taken back, uh, held back by jurisdictional concerns. We will learn this uh, in, in probably this year, uh, in the course of this year, whether international um, litigation could happen, but it would be international litigation before Human Rights Court, uh, not an environmental court as, as, as such. Uh, that will also limit the ambit of what that's this court, an international human rights court, can do. Uh, what then is the role of domestic law and domestic courts? Um, if there is no international consensus, uh, or international consensus doesn't go far enough, uh, we have to uh, uh, look for uh, domestic law for going the hard way uh, towards uh, um, 200 or so legal systems of the world and uh, see to it that um, we find there should be consensus is built via that road. And, and actually international law allows this. Uh, the third source of international law, which uh, according to the ICJ statute, which is somewhat underused uh, these days, speaks indeed of domestic uh, law as uh, being able to build on an international consensus on international law. Uh, so actually that road may be also a road opened up by international law. Um, but if we look at those domestic uh, decisions, um, I will look at two countries in particular, which unfortunately are both in Europe and um, are near to each other, such as the Netherlands and Germany, 
Uh, if you look at those um, decisions, you will find, um, in fact, there have been two two roads to go. Um, one, some of the, most of those decisions address states, they don't address individuals, they don't address companies, or they don't address polluters as such, they address the duties of states toward individuals. So in fact, going down a rights road, uh, so it may be similar to what uh, sooner or later international courts and tribunals are going to do. Um, and uh, you find zero gender judgment uh, in the Netherlands, even if the Netherlands do not have a constitutional court as such, um, they have some sort of, uh, of course, a rights-based jurisprudence. Uh, and uh, relying on, on the Paris Agreement, so relying on an international uh, uh, treaty, uh, asking states to do their lot uh, and uh, to do more uh, because the goals, or the ambitious goals of the Paris Agreement are not met by current promises and even less so by current action. Similarly, uh, my own court, the Federal Constitutional Court, opened up the road of, in fact, using fundamental rights. And, and one particular feature of the judgment of ours, which surprised many, was that we didn't go the road uh, uh, which you would expect when you read the German constitution uh, without much knowledge of, of law, you would expect uh, climate change to be addressed via Article 20A, which has split the environment article, in, in, if you will, uh, of the uh, constitutional um, uh, structure and uh, of the of the Grundgesetz of the fundamental law. Uh, in fact, what we found is that this article gives so much leeway to the state legislature that it was not uh, the main road to check uh, le national legislation against. Uh, so actually what we do is going back to first principles, if you like, to rights as such, uh, to the basic rights of uh, to do whatever one pleases, which actually would, uh, in, uh, on a superficial uh, reading, uh, would in fact emphasize freedom to uh, uh, damage the environment over um, the freedom of, of others uh, to use the environment in the future. Uh, nevertheless, um, we have concluded that um, if you combine this environmental article with this uh, right to have rights in a way uh, and to do what you please, and also, of course, uh, in an intersubjective structure, everybody has a right, those rights of freedom, and not only present generations, but there must be some rights and some freedoms be open to future generations. Uh, and this uh, combined with the insight that with regard to climate change, current inaction intervenes in future freedoms. I mean, that actually, if you do not accept that point, you can't, you won't accept the judgment uh, or the decision, actually, no judgment, the decision which came out of it. You have to accept this connection. Today's inactions uh, towards climate change, working against climate change, are damaging already future freedoms because then the, the climate budget, if you like, is exhausted uh, when future generations uh, uh, are at the helm and then uh, they are, have a loss of freedom and may even be opened up basis this scare image of an environmental dictatorship, not of today, uh, not by uh, prohibiting domestic flights or using your car, uh, but actually uh, by uh, narrowing the path of future durations to, to address climate change. Uh, and that was the avenue by which the court said that uh, the climate legislation was not appropriate, was not sufficient to fulfill the pledges in, of Paris. And the court also said, well, um, maybe this international agreement may not be good enough, but it is the only one we have, and it is the one which has been accepted by states and also by the German state as binding, and therefore you now uh, the German state must do what it has promised, uh, even regardless of whether others are actually fulfilling their duties, because that would, if we do, if we would do that, that we only ask for others uh, and only ask what others are doing, then we would be held back and would probably uh, never achieve those goals. So that was one approach. Um, the other approach we find also in the Netherlands with a shell judgment, but also in Germany with regard to the RWE case. Uh, um, so the question is more looking to the um, uh, firms and to the enterprises who seem to be at the control uh, or controlling uh, pollution, maybe even more than states do, uh, and ask them to fulfill their duty, um, regardless, in fact, of uh, domestic uh, climate, of dis domestic decisions and legislation. Uh, making them directly responsible at the international level. But this immediately opens up questions um, with regard to the RWE case. Uh, it is the responsibility of this uh, German um, um, 
uh, business, uh, which has for a century now uh, looking for our supply, energy supplies, uh, among other things, um, whether it can be held responsible for environmental damage, which was a cause in, at the other, uh, at, in Peru, far away from our places. Um, this, in fact, behavior, which was considered legal at the time. So it looks to the past and to responsibility to make good on, on mistakes of the past, which at the time were not considered mistakes, were considered to be completely legal. Um, and that is, of course, a very high burden to meet before a domestic court. We will see what the courts are doing. This is not litigated to its end now, uh, already. But on the other hand, of course, we have the shell judgment of the Dutch court, which also directly uh, uh, creates duties uh, to address climate change of, uh, in this case, a shell company, which tries now to flee it by, in fact, changing its business, uh, its business uh, seat to, to, uh, uh, to, to the United Kingdom. Um, so, but the problem with this kind of legislation is, of course, where does the legitimacy come from? Suddenly making uh, somebody responsible for past acts which were considered legal at the time, both nationally and internationally. Uh, and secondly, uh, with regard to shell future uh, behavior that is considered legal, um, that has not been outruled by the place of business uh, on by a domestic or business law, by domestic business law, how can you uh, ask them to do uh, something? Where is the legitimacy coming from, at least if you do not have concrete domestic um, legislation in place? So actually, you have to look at um, questions of democratic legitimacy. Uh, and again, you see that uh, going to states is maybe not be the one way uh, to, to meet the goals, uh, but uh, what you need is both international agreements or, and, at the same, or, and on the other hand, a domestic structure which allows to implement them and maybe also a domestic and international uh, law which assigns duties and responsibility uh, and compensation duties also of compensation uh, uh, in before probably uh, courts can do their jobs. Uh, one one uh, additional avenue is opened up by Colombia and by this idea of uh, giving directly rights to nature and then looking for uh, domestic and international actors, helping them to enforce them before courts. Um, advocates of nature. Um, in fact, my court has rejected this under German law. This did not work. Um, they... Oh, I think our speaker is frozen. Uh, Justice Paulus, can you hear us? Oh, no. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. The splash. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, and um, but as I said, rights of nature before domestic courts would be another approach, but also an approach which, of course, must be uh, supported by uh, the law in place. Uh, maybe that will be an avenue for the future. Of course, the next question we will have is who is the advocate? Uh, are you a self-appointed advocate? What makes you an advocate of nature? And that may be a question which Tom may address because he actually had activism as one of the ways uh, to deal with climate change. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I'm speaking for too long. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to um, to give the panelists who have uh, presented their work on the panel a short opportunity to react directly. Uh, Tom has been addressed, um, but please be brief so that we can open up then uh, quickly to the discussion and use the remaining time also for um, more inclusive debate with our audience. Tom, do you want to, to respond? Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to start, although I think on the, on the specific point of, of who can speak for, for nature, that's something that Guillaume is much better placed to address than I have, having actually written on that uh, point a little. Um, thank you to, to all the other panelists for some, some really fascinating presentations and, and also to uh, Jutta Kone and Andreas Paulus for those very interesting reflections. Um, perhaps I can start just by, by pushing back very gently against this, this um, uh, comment that, that Andreas Paulus made the, uh, of the activist who spoke with the voice of Tom, who, which I, I, I'm sure was uh, only kindly meant, but uh, I want to, to to push back on it very slightly because I think it implies a a, a separation in in 
in roles, in, in hats, uh, that implies a, a proper role for a lawyer as somebody who is entirely neutral, who, who, who leaves their convictions outside the door to their office when they arrive in the morning. Um, and I, I, I think that's uh, not entirely a, a useful framing for me personally. I have a number of, of convictions that I hold very dearly, including a commitment in the in the institution of law and a commitment to the, the balanced knowledge creation process of, of academia, and also a commitment to the defense of the environment. And I think those uh, inform me and motivate me in my, in my role as an academic and as a lawyer. I don't see those as being something which, which involve changing hats in the course of the day. Um, but that's just a, a small personal reflection. Um, I, I very much enjoyed the, the uh, the, the overview of the, the case law and the reasoning process that, that, that you gave us. And I, I wondered if you could mention also, um, in particular, in light of what you were saying around the, the RWE case, around the, uh, the Milieu Defensi judgment against Shell in the Netherlands, as, a, as another case from those two jurisdictions that you mentioned, and how that um, fits into or intersects with the, the, the discussions you were having around those existing cases. Um, uh, in, in relation to the, the comments of, of Yusuf Brunet, um, I very much enjoyed your comment around that the law needs a, a foundation in share and shared understandings, um, which I think is absolutely true, both at the, the kind of the instant level that you were talking about, but also at the, the deeper level. And it's, it's that, I think, that um, captures something about what I was trying to say with the, the state of nature point, in there's a lot of the, the deeper level shared understandings that we have for law and of law are drawn from some of these philosophical discussions, particularly in the 17th and 18th, uh, sorry, 18th and 19th centuries, um, that still motivate and still underpin different functions, different ideas in the law, particularly around things like property, sovereignty, obligation, some of the structuring concepts, both of, of domestic and, and international laws. Um, I, I have some other questions that I would like to ask the other panelists, but I'll just keep it to one so that I'm not taking up too much time. And I want to direct that at, at Pedro. Um, I, I really enjoyed your, your thought of um, responsibility for, for pandemic risk. I, I confess I haven't come across that before, so I found that really interesting. Um, and I wondered, when you talk about pandemic risk and, and, and uh, in terms of the, the responsibility for pandemics, should we be thinking of that as responsibility for emergence as a sort of blunt instrument that we can, we can only apply when a pandemic emerges? Or is there some way to assess and quantify the risk itself and to regulate that on an, on an ongoing basis? Or is it just that breakthrough event? And I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I hand over to Pedro and uh, hopefully he will have an answer. Uh, please keep it also brief, Pedro. Yes, gladly. And then thank you, Tom, for uh, the follow up question. And you know, this will allow me to clarify what I meant with responsibility. So, of course, I mean, well, the, the doctrine of, uh, on international responsibility, uh, sorry, on responsibility for international wrongful acts uh, was not, I, I didn't mean to use it so bluntly and directly, but rather, you know, this more general idea of responsibility in the sense of, you know, what kind of human activities are known to increase the risk. Unfortunately, I'm mean, referring to your point on whether it is possible to quantify the risk, you know, existing uh, scientific, i.e. medical, epidemiological, and public health research cannot give us a mathematically exact uh, quantification of which, how much risk a specific driver creates so that we can really you know, engage in a predictive exercise. It's, uh, so what we deal, what we see in these studies is pro a probabilistic assessment, right? It, it's probable, so it, it may or may not happen, but at the very least, we should then strive towards uh, tackling those uh, human activities that we are, know that increase risk even though we cannot come up with a mathematically exact uh, quantification of such risk. And um, uh, 
And basically it means that maybe there is a way to overcome the current uh, understanding and referring to your idea of common understanding, uh, shared understanding, sorry, that you know, pandemics are currently seen as um, inevitable. So if they happen, well, that's too bad. They couldn't have been avoided. Uh, at least that's the understanding on international law. But maybe this uh, can somehow be addressed by tackling complexity and by, you know, as Justice Policy was referring, by creating some consensus, political and uh, first, of course, an epistemic consensus of, of what it is that we need that we could change in order to reduce the risk of these pandemics from occurring. Right? So uh, I hope I more or less has addressed uh, the, your question, Tom Minfulia, and uh, thank you again for, uh, for raising it. I thank you. Back to you um, Alexandra. Yeah. yeah, I would like to hand over to Guillaume, who has also been mentioned, uh, and Tom has handed over uh, Justice Paulo's questions to him, and maybe he has a response. So if I remember correctly, it was about the, the difficult question of the representation of nature in front of courts. So I did actually write something about that last year. And it was about how exactly do we decide on who gets to represent nature? So I've looked at a couple of examples and there was this interesting one from New Zealand with um, giving legal personality to a river. And what they decided to do in this um, legal act of giving personality was to split the representation mechanism between the state and the indigenous and local communities. The idea was that no, basically, it was not up to one single group to hold the interest of the rivers, because then in this case, you don't really have a right of nature. You just have another alley to speak through. So it's not really representing nature, it's just using nature to speak for yourself. And the conclusion that was interesting to, to, to reach when thinking about how to speak for nature, it's kind of similar of, to what we already have today when we have some um, scientific assessments, for example, for, the, for any environmental matters. What tends to be uh, standard practice now is to have di different type of knowledge uh, being represented in these types of scientific assessments. So for instance, if you look at the big biodiversity assessments, you have biology, economics, um, sociology, anthropology, everything is put in. And this brings about kind of a balanced understanding of the current trajectories of the environment. And I think there's something to be learned about that when thinking about how to represent nature, because maybe in this plurality of, of um, interest and knowledge, you have something that is somewhat balanced. Now, how can you actually transfer that to concrete uh, options for different contexts? That's a whole different thing. So I think one should be careful not to see the right of nature as this wonderful solution that would take care of every environmental problem. It's, it's far more complex than that. It just, it, it's a very important symbol in terms of how we think about nature. But then when you get down to the uh, spe specifics and how do you, you put it into place this, this right of nature, it ends up being very much a conversation among humans. And that's all, all something that needs to be kept in mind, I think. Okay, thank you. Um, before handing over to Dana, I would invite you if you have questions to just put a one in the chat and then uh, we can uh, immediately um, go on with the, the round of questions. Dana. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. And I'll briefly, I'll be very brief, but I'll pick up the question that Hitopone raised, what kind of role do we want law to play? And I think that interestingly really shows that I, I think there is a double challenge in thinking about what role law can play vis-a-vis -vis environmental crisis. And that is on the one hand, there's a difficulty of effectiveness. There's a question of what can law even do well, at the same time, I think, and that's my focus in a way, we need to be very critical about the blind spots, the power uh, that uh, influences what role, what international law does. So in a way, this is a really difficult situation to advance international law, to tackle environmental crises, to tackle questions of climate change. Well, at the same time, being aware that 
we do have particular perspectives on what uh, the law needs to be. So in thinking about those more historical issues, I also really um, believe we can learn about um, mistakes made um, historically or blind spots that were present and hopefully um, be working towards effectiveness while being very critical about the law. And just to say maybe one or two more sentence because I forgot earlier, I wanted to address this notion of narrative authority and then didn't uh, come back to it. I think there is something, there is a power exercised by narrating what the causes of problems are. And it's different from just knowledge production. It's not even related to claiming that this is the only possible causal link or that this is the one explanation. It is more that by being in a position of power, by being in international organizations, by issuing legal documents, people participate in a narration of how the world is, how things relate. And this kind of authority that international law exercises, also sometimes through those soft law documents, I think is really important in the topics we're talking about, which are of so complex, diverse causalities and also um, emergent dynamics. So um, just wanted to raise this again and I'll keep it at that also, of course, thank you Andreas Paulus also for lots of interesting thoughts that um, I'll just take a comment. So thank you, Dana. Um, I see a question by Edith Brown Weiss. Uh, Professor Weiss, I would, Brown Weiss, I would invite you to, um, to put on your, your camera. Um, we will, since we started a little bit late, uh, we will take up to 10 more minutes for uh, this entire session to give also room to, uh, to the panelists to answer to the questions that are um, coming, coming now. I hope that's, uh, that's fine for everyone participating on the panel. Professor Brown Weiss, you have the floor. We can't hear thank you. you. Yeah, ah, okay. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, uh, to be with the Max Planck Institute, of which I'm so very fond, um, in Heidelberg. Uh, and I also, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with uh, Judge Paulus here. Uh, I think the decision that was done by the German, uh, uh, the Federal Constitutional Court is, as you know, a path-breaking decision, and it's very uh, gratifying to me uh, to hear the exp your explanation. Uh, namely that today's inactions interfere with future generations freedom and I just want to say how pleased I am with that and how it will be a feature of our revised course book on international environmental law. My question uh, really relates to a basic norm. Uh, Professor Brudet got it at it when she said what can the rule of law uh, of prevention uh, what can the rule of, pre of preventing harm uh, do in protecting the commons and I want to take that in a, sort of a reverse which is to say, what can a rule of cooperation uh, do in protecting the commons and public goods? Uh, a public good, for example, in the health area in the pandemic being controlling the pandemic as a public good. And how could we use that? Does it in fact mean that there are more actors that are there? That does it encompass then uh, more types of legal instruments other than international agreements um, that could be useful there? Thank you. And again, my pleasure at, at joining all of you and seeing some old friends. Thank you so much. Um, I also see a question by Dr. Khalid Shad. Uh, Dr. Shad, would you like to, to pose your questions, your question in person? Uh, no. Hello. Um, yeah, hello. Yeah, okay. am, I, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, okay thank you very much. Uh, for, for, for providing me uh, such a, a informative platform. So my question is about actually is about the post COVID phase and medical treat, treatment, medical waste treatment, you know, especially in uh, developing countries where they do not have a proper mechanism and also they do not have advanced uh, technology. And also they are facing illicit uh, waste shipment from developed to developing country. So in uh, this post-COVID phase, this is very crucial uh, situation in developing countries. So I would like, uh, I mean, our panelists can uh, uh, share their uh, views about this. Will be very uh, useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other questions, or is there any 
Any other intervention? No, I don't think I've overlooked someone. So then I would like to, um, to give back the floor to the panelists um, in the order that we had for the initial presentations. I would like to start with Guillaume Futaza and then just uh, go around and uh, the final word is then to our distinguished commentators. Guillaume. I was still thinking on this question of the, um, the, the cooperation um, for the protection of the common. And it made me think of the, the, um, the creative thinking that this environmental crisis has um, generated in the legal profession and, le and legal academia. And for instance, there's, I think there's some interesting things to do in going back to the declaration on friendly relations between states and the, and the principle it has highlighted. Um, we have tried uh, with Professor Peters while writing our chapter on good faith to think about how to draw this principle that is quite basic and blurry and try to make it more fit for the 21st century. And we came up with the idea, which is at this point basically a proposition, that there might be a way of thinking about legitimate expectation of individuals towards the international engagement of the states in matters of environment. So for instance, if good faith has to be applied horizontally, basically saying that states have to commit to their international obligation because of the Pacta Sun Servanda and so on, why shouldn't states um, fulfill the legitimate expectation of their citizen when they sign a treaty? And so I think this, of course, is kind of science fiction in a way. It's not something that's going to happen anytime soon. But I really find it interesting that in the context of environmental crisis, we are coming back to these very, very well uh, established principle of international law, and we are trying to stretch them, to turn them around and to see how they can be suited. So I think in terms of concluding remarks based on what we heard around, I think there is some, some hope, maybe uh, too little, too late, but there is some interesting um, mutations happening because of this environmental crisis that we are witnessing, and mutations that are both intellectual, mutations that are legal, and I hope it will be enough to put out put us out of danger but it needs to be more needs to be faster thank you so much um tom you have the floor thank you and uh thank you for for the, the very interesting questions uh, and also for the for the additional question that I've, I've seen in the in the chat um they're all i think very very multifaceted questions and I'll try and do a little justice at least to them. Um, in relation to the cooperation question to begin with, uh, I think I would I would start by saying um, as, as, as Professor Brown Weiss will know far better than, than I do, um, that, that international environment that cooperation in international environmental law is something that I think is a relatively uh, modern innovation. If you look at the, the, the foundations of international environmental law and the ways in which international environmental law had its founding in, in, in what was really natural resources law, the focus was on state competition rather than cooperation. In fact, enabling very minimal levels of, of cooperation, largely through self-limitation in the amount of a resource that a state will take in order to maximize self-interest. Um, but the, the development towards a more cooperation based regime in some of the, the, the treaty areas, I think, has been um, very welcome. I, I think that's something that we can see as a feature of the Paris Agreement as it has developed, perhaps not um, as it was initially conceived, but certainly in the ways that it has changed and developed with the ratchet mechanism. The idea behind the ratchet being that, that each state puts in its contribution towards a cooperative goal of meeting the, the treaty aims. And that process is, is becoming, I think, while remaining entirely bilateral, it's becoming more collaborative, particularly with things like the, the upgrade to a one-year cycle compared to a five-year cycle that was agreed in Glasgow at COP26. Um, and if we're seeing that kind of development in, in some of the treaty regimes, then I would, 
I, I would hope to see some similar developments in the customary law regimes, and I think that could only be um, a beneficial development, um, but whether there is uh, enough grounds as yet for the, the founding of a sort of norm of cooperation, um, I would love to see it. I don't think we're quite there yet in, in legal terms. Um, in terms of, of compensation, I think that compensation is going to be absolutely key in resolving some of these environmental crises, whether that happens through a negotiated form in terms of the, the loss and damage negotiations, or whether it comes as a result of an international judgment. Compensation is, is one of the hard tools that laws have in order to uh, compel change of behavior. Um, but not only as a, a hard tool, but also as a recognition of the, the historical harm that's been caused by the the, the rich and highly developed West compared to many states in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Southeast Asia and other parts of the world that, that haven't had the same opportunity for fossil heavy, fossil heavy development. Um, so I think there's a, a, a moral and a legal aspect here in terms of the role that compensation can play. In terms of medical waste, um, first of all, I, I am, I'm grateful that you're talking about this in, in terms of the post COVID phase. I think that that's unfortunately slightly optimistic. Um, I think it's something that we need to deal with already in the in the ongoing COVID phase. Uh, there are international legal instruments that confirm that, that deal with the transport of hazardous wastes. Um, I have no idea whether uh, all of the medical waste that you're referring to would fall under that rubric, but certainly I think some of it would. Um, and I think that it would be very important for those uh, states that are involved in that transport to pay attention to those international legal rules and for those organizations which support those rules to be properly resourced to, to enforce them and to advise states in their uh, implementation. Um, but there's probably a gray area in terms of waste that is not considered fully hazardous, but which has some risks associated with it that also needs to be uh, dealt with. And I, I'm afraid I'm, I'm as, as stumped as anyone else for exactly how to do that. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I immediately hand over to Dana Schmalz. Yes, thank you. Um, on the question of compensation, so I can't say anything very specific because, of course, compensation itself is very broad and it will follow up questions on for what. And, but I think what it does point, the point to is that we will have to talk about the broader conceptions of what responsibilities are. So compensation will not be answered by mere scientific facts, but always depend on understandings of whose responsibility for what to which extent. So those broad normative questions of interrelatedness that have been um, briefly talking about, I think are also part of thinking about uh, compensation. And then on the point that Edith Brown Weiss raised, and I think it relates to what Andreas Paulus had also sa said regarding democratic legitimacy. So in a way, we might be rooting or we are rooting for those very progressive judgments, but there is a lot of theorizing on what is the um, for a foundation of legitimacy for what the how the law develops and I think in a way this revives debates that maybe have been a bit silent on democracy and international law so I think it pushes us to think about democracy in terms that go beyond um, just the democratic decision making within the state and the German federal court climate decision was really novel in thinking about future generations, but also had this important point of thinking about cross-border um, obligations towards people abroad. So I think just to say in terms of democratic legitimacy and these interrelations, there is an aspect of thinking how can we make voices heard that not are necessarily on the forefront of the international debate. And I think this will be crucial for environmental crises. Thank you so much. Uh, and now I would like to hand over to Pedro. Yes, thanks again for the wonderful questions. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, of course, they're quite challenging to tackle in such a short time. But to Professor Brown Weiss, um, and her you know, question on how do we envisage you know, 
taking care of addressing the, the comments, right? And how does this idea of the comments relate to the, to the pandemic, for example? I guess one key challenge where we do need a shared understanding as, as Tom was referring to is, okay, where do the comments begin, right? Do the comments begin when this disease starts affecting us as humans and that's the point in which we start, you know, considering this to be a comments or do we really go deeper and you know, address the comments as this more holistic understanding, uh, which might of course require a very complex and very sophisticated uh, legal regime that might be very difficult, might not be feasible to achieve considering the current uh, stage of political consensus referring back to this uh, point. But nevertheless, I do believe that now that there is a clarity on you know, what, what can happen in case we don't take care of these comments and why do we do need a collective action to uh, really make sure that this risk, which can be all over the world, right? This can be triggered all over the world, needs to have a global uh, solution. I hope I more or less addressed the idea of how to uh, how to understand the protection of the commons in the, in the context of a pandemic. But and, and just briefly to uh, Dr. Sad's uh, question indeed, and referring back to Tom's uh, answer, indeed the Basel Convention on you know, Transboundary uh, Movement on Hazardous Wastes, I do believe uh, medical waste is included in the annex that refers to what is considered a hazardous waste. But of course, then the question remains, and going back to your point, Dr. Sass, indeed we have witnessed an unprecedented, I guess, unprecedented amount of waste, medical waste being produced in such a short period of time, and that may have put this, a strain on the system for disposing of such waste. And I do wonder, though, under the Basel Convention, what, what you know, whether under international law this would nevertheless be uh, be regulated before it acquires a transboundary dimension, right? before it gets translated, uh, transported from one country to another. And this is where it's tricky because uh, you know, what are these countries going to do with all that unprecedented amount of medical uh, waste in, in such a short period of time? This to me is still an unsettled and under-researched and unsettled uh, question. And that, I'm sorry, I don't give a satisfactory answer to uh, your uh, question, but that is, uh, my view. Uh, thanks again for such engaging questions. Thank you, Pedro. And the last word goes to our two commentators. First, I would invite uh, Professor Paulus, and then the final word goes to Dean Jutta Brunet. Well, thank you very much, Alexander, and thank you very much for all the participants uh, of this panel. Um, we are really tackling here the big questions. Uh, and of course, those questions or uh, speaking with Darendorf, you would say these are not questions because they have no clear answers. They are problems uh, uh, which can never be solved. And that actually is, is the beauty and also, but of course, also the problem we are working with, um, that the solutions are not, not ready made. And, and the one big question is, of course, has been raised by it is uh, Ron Rice, who has done environmental law when I was still uh, at school um, already. Um, so, uh, indeed, who is who's looking for the global commons? The tragedy of the commons uh, is, a, is a, of course, um, um, uh, the, the the big problem. Uh, on the other hand, um, law is an instrument which is there for, um, in a Kantian way, if you like, to get the, my freedom together with the freedom of the other, and, and nature, uh, and respecting nature is the precondition of the freedom of the other. And that may be also the, the core of the, of the climate uh, decision of, of, of my Senate. And I think that is thinking of the other, um, the, the involvement, uh, the inclusion of the other, if you speak with Habermas, these are the, 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 the ideas. Um, so actually maybe I was too um, modest with what law can do. And we, maybe we, we are not allowed to be too modest. Um, we could also, we should remind uh, us and everybody else that, um, we have to find uh, a formula with, with getting the rights of, uh, of ours together with the rights of others. And this includes uh, those future generations. Uh, and the, the good thing is for lawyers, which is very important because otherwise you get in all sorts of philosophical and ethical troubles, is that those future generations are already with us. They are living people, uh, living individuals. Uh, and that uh, gives us this, this responsibility, and I agree with you, uh, all of you, that actually without responsibility, 
uh, and uh, without meaningful responsibility, that is also duties of compensation. Uh, uh, this is all for nothing. Uh, and uh, that is something I think we all have to work together in, 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 in the future. And I'm looking forward to uh, those, both to the description of the problem and to some possible avenues for solutions coming out from Heidelberg and Berlin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and now the fun word to Dean Bonnet. Well, uh, I think the main points have been made. I just want to underscore that I think really it is um, what the, the challenge is. Lawyers are probably wired to be reasonable and balance all considerations and so on. And the challenge for us, I think, all is that as much as that is certainly, you know, um, sort of the way that I think about it, but we may have to be more radical, right? So I think we have to articulate community interests, one of Andreas Paulus's contributions in the past to try um, and, and articulate that legally speaking. We also have to, and, and in that context, I guess, um, yes, we, Edith Brown Rice referred to cooperation. So I think that obviously is a, a key challenge, how can international law play a part in that necessary cooperation? I think one way is through structuring treaties in a way that brings everybody into the conversation and, and, and. But as she also already said, it's no longer just states that have to participate. We have to think much more broadly and at multiple levels and how can, um, to what extent, if we're thinking about international law, can international law um, facilitate that? And sometimes maybe it can't, and it has to be a transnational initiative or a private initiative and not a formal legal initiative, but something that has legal traits, but isn't law in the sense that the public international lawyer might be used to. I think we're actually at a point where we have to try everything because time is kind of running out on many of the issues that we've been talking about. And that goes back then also to the role um, of litigation, potentially compensation, but it is to try for lawyers to be creative at all the levels that they can be, even if they only capture a small slice of what is a much bigger problem, but if they can gain traction in court or wherever it is by framing something as a human rights issue, framing something as um, an interference with territory if it has to be that, or articulating under what circumstances all states are entitled to push back on an ergo omnis basis, for example, against harm to the atmosphere, whatever it may be. We've got it, we've got to get busy. Thank you so much. I think this has been quite an encouragement to be not too modest about the role of law and the possibilities of law. And uh, I think we have also seen a kind of overview of research and seen to what extent the current crisis is shaping our research at the Institute. And of course, also the, the work of many of the participants that have been here with us uh, tonight. I would like to thank again the panelists, also on behalf of Armin von Bogdani and Anna Peters, who unfortunately could not be with us tonight, but send their warm greetings. I would particularly like to thank again the two members of our Academic Advisory Board for making time to join us tonight. And I hope to see all of you back very soon. Our next event will be on the 10th and on the 8th of February. On the, the 8th, we will talk about the new book of uh, Jan Mende, Dr. Jan Mende of the Institute on the on universality of human rights that will be in German. And on the 10th of February, we will talk about who's the guardian of the freedom of speech uh, and the role of platform regulation. We will have with us, among other distinguished speakers, Professor Catalina Botero, who is the vice chair of the uh, Facebook um, oversight board. And we will discuss these uh, very pressing uh, questions on that evening. We hope to also have in-person events later this year to have drinks and more conversation after the event that will not be possible tonight. But I wish all of you a very good evening and a, a very good rest of the day. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight and see you soon again. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>